Hello and welcome to First Unitarian Church of Providence, where we love beyond belief. I'm Neil Bartholomew, the chair of the worship committee, which hosts a series of services during the summer when our senior minister is away. These services are led by lay members and friends of the congregation, and the music is also provided by members and friends of the congregation. As our bridging team continues working on the logistics and planning for bringing us safely and equitably back into our meeting house on Sunday mornings, we are presenting the services for the first portion of the summer as a series of online videos. We hope that you will enjoy the variety of wisdom and talent that our congregation has to offer. And now, please join in our unison reading as we light our chalice. This light burns also in our hearts and it lights our path towards harmony, justice, and hope for all. Good morning. My name is Annie Bissett, and I'm happy to be your worship associate for this July 11, 2021 worship service at First Unitarian Church of Providence. Our guest speaker today is First U member Susan Hardy, a lifelong artist who began her career as a landscape painter and gradually evolved her techniques toward abstraction, creating artworks that evoke and journal her life experiences, life experiences which are rich and varied, as you'll hear. Like Susan, I am also a visual artist, so we were delighted to be paired for this service, and our discussions flowed easily as we worked together. Interestingly, as we were composing today's service, the new mission statement for First Unitarian was revealed, and how serendipitous it was to read this sentence. We rejoice in the creations of artists, musicians, scientists, and the contributions of each other. So today we take this mission to heart, and we rejoice in the creations, especially of artists and musicians. Please welcome our guest musician, Janice Okumian.
a reading from the book Art and Fear. Making art is difficult. We leave drawings unfinished and stories unwritten. We do work that does not feel like our own. We repeat ourselves. We stop before we've mastered our materials, or we continue on long after their potential is exhausted. Often, the work we have not done seems more real in our minds than the pieces we have completed. And so questions arise. How does art get done? Why does it not get done? And what is the nature of the difficulties that stop so many who start? These questions, which seem so timeless, may actually be particular to our age. It may have been easier to paint bison on the cave walls long ago than to write this or any other sentence today. Other people in other times and places had some robust institutions to shore them up. The church, the clan, ritual tradition. Not so today. Today, almost no one feels shored up. Today, artwork does not emerge from a secure common ground. Making art now means working in the face of uncertainty. It means living with doubt and contradiction, doing something no one much cares whether or not you do, and for which there might be neither audience nor reward. Making the work you want to make means setting aside these doubts so that you can see clearly what you have done and thereby see where to go next. Making the work you want to make means finding nourishment within the work itself. This is not the age of faith, truth, and certainty. Our hymn this morning is number 90, From All the Fret and Fever of the Day. The lyrics of this hymn describe a turning within, a turning toward silence in order to listen for a voice inside. This is certainly one of the functions of worship, and it can also be one of the functions of art. Let's sing hymn number 90 together, and then we will hear from Susan Hardy. COVID repurposed an artist's journey during the pandemic. Containment, keeping something harmful under control or within limits. Isolation, cut off, alone. These two words laid the ground rules and gave meaning to the artwork I produced during 2020. I have been doing art as a career since I graduated from the Maryland Institute College of Art in 1974. I had no expectations. I just wanted to paint and draw with specific interest and in abstracting what I saw in the natural world. Seems very long ago. During the first month of the onslaught of the pandemic, it felt like a pleasant hibernation. I thought maybe a month of wait and see and then life would be back to normal but life came to a halt and a state of confinement peppered with lack of stimulation 
low-grade anxiety and general malaise greeted me daily. I found I could tame this excess of emotion by exercising vigorously and reading copiously like never before. I found a place to be daily, but it did not involve making art. My way of control when I feel under siege is keeping things tight and organized, and you will notice in the series of collages I will share with you exactly that, a box in the middle with information and a border that holds that information tight, cradled in a contained space and keeping those moments of awareness about multiple experiences well guarded. By doing this, I calm myself and hold a parcel of a big life in an emotionally small space. I would rather leave a shard of ambiguity and something to ponder rather than a large monumental slab that says, here I am. After the long summer of 2020 and my looking for a joyful experience, a certain settling in phase of adapting happened and with it an idea form for an art project for my upcoming show at the Providence Art Club. I set out to photograph the mundane inside of my home and outside my home in a square block radius, hoping to find satisfaction in those small accessible regions of my life. Venturing outside seemed eerily quiet and scary, but I found a safe harbor in the forlorn alleys of my neighborhood. The air conditioners jutting out basement windows drew my interest, and I pondered their inclusion a thousand years from now, protruding out of a landfill like amphora buried in Pompeii, and someone would dig up the metal box carry it home, and display it as an ancient treasure of art. So, if not for COVID, would I ever thought about this concept of the ordinary being extraordinary. However, I was not feeling fulfilled during these capers. I was exhausted. I nixed the photo idea in December and pawed my way back into my voluminous flat files with reckless intent, scooping out old prints and drawings and paintings on board and flinging them onto the floor. I was determined to make art out of whatever was at hand. Demolishing these pieces seemed so fitting, the needed catharsis. I chose a series of paintings to repurpose, I did, right after 9-11 another tumultuous time, and they became the object of my demolition. Like COVID, 9-11 blurred my ability to make sense of anything. I tore and cut and used a sander to scrape away layers of paint. Surprisingly, out of the chaos I was creating, I found meaning and semblance. Out of COVID came the ability for me to cull moments and fragments and make art out of the condition of isolation. I came alive again after months of retreating. I would be remiss if I did not give a bit of background and say a little about the sources for my continual supply of abstract images. Here is a tiny bit. The Chesapeake summers of my youth provided me with horizon lines of sea and sky. My father's voluminous library and especially Life magazine, whose photographs introduced me to new societies, oceans away, to ancient cave paintings in France, and then bewildering issues of disparity at home. It was only natural that at this stage of my life, I became attracted to a world that had the quality of being different. What fascinated me were the headhunters in the Amazon, the Aztec and Olmec of Mexico, and the tidy life of the Maasai in Kenya. 
In the middle of art school in 1971, the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C., where I grew up, hosted a huge exhibit under the direction of Rhode Island's very own J. Carter Brown. It brought to life the continent of Africa in an exhibit called African Art in Motion. It was big and bold and shattered all my preconceived notions of sublime line and shape and my rigidly organized thought patterns of making art. It stirred my senses and changed the way I painted and drew. Spin ahead 20 years and I find myself living in West Africa for 10 years. The desert of Mauritania, the civil war in Liberia, and lastly, Nigeria. A country so full of life, it has been called a cross between Harlem and Calcutta. I was constantly being jostled by the energy. Nothing was ever clear cut. The smell of wood, fire and fish, thorny landscapes full of joyful, but sometimes terrifying experiences, and then also vibrant, joyful, and celebratory art and theater of dazzling color and intellect. Everything about Africa spoke to me in terms of how I made art. I felt I had landed. In those summers of living in Africa, we escaped to our island in Canada, which is accessible only by a little powerboat. It is a scruffy, windswept rock with jagged edges and everywhere you look is a tumbling sea replete with horizon line and other islands. Nothing is ever static with plenty of time to ponder the here and now in a little red rowboat. The advantages I have had are rough hewn by and large and it is reflected in my work. So as I meandered through this process of repurposing old art into new art, it was the isolation of containment of 2020 that became a powerful force that led the charge. Combine that with the experiences of a childhood on the Chesapeake Bay, time in desertic and tropical Africa, and respites on a secluded island in Atlantic Canada, and this merging and melding grew and blossomed into this series. Thank you. Let your life be your art. Allow the golden glistening moments to weave themselves into an intricately crafted tapestry of experiences, thread by thread, intertwining past, present, future into one awe-inspiring spectacle for the universe to behold here, now. Let your life be your art. The way you move your body as you work on the street, in the forest, in the kitchen. Allow the carefully choreographed way your hands dance as you prepare dinner to become a performance, rhythmically chopping and stirring and mixing. Let your life be your art. Surrender your speech to poetry. Note the beauty of your articulations as they land on the ears of your beloved like a sonnet, caressing them with love, understanding, and compassion, igniting light, illuminating their loveliness. Let your life be your art. The way your feet lovingly graze the earth like paint strokes on a canvas, sketching the soil, each step with a brilliant palette of gentleness care, lightness. Let your life be your art. Let's now spend a few moments of silence together.
In this unusual time when we cannot be together as we are accustomed, the work to fulfill the mission of our church continues. Our staff work harder than ever to support our connections as a community and our efforts to create justice in the wider community continue. The need for us to fund these efforts is even more important than ever. Please go to firstunitarianprov.org and click on the Give menu. You may do so during the following offertory music, or you may prefer to wait until after the end of the service. As always, thank you for all that you give, all that you do, and all that you are. We hope that you've enjoyed our service today. As a self-supporting congregation and a beloved aspiring community, we rely on generosity and commitment to keep us vital and relevant. We invite you to practice generosity and dedication by going to www.firstunitarianprov.org and clicking where it says, Give, to support the mission and vision of this church. And now, please join me as we extinguish our chalice. Carry the flame of peace, love, and hope until we meet again. May